All right. Hi everyone, it's me again. And this time I am joined by three amazing panelists. Uh, I'll make brief introductions and I'll turn it over to them to introduce themselves as well. So let's start with left to right. We have Arthi, uh, Dr. Arthi Setu Madhavan, who is the head of user research and ethics and society at Microsoft Cloud and AI. Um, then we have Rose Margaret Ekin Etuwa, apologies if I mispronounced it. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to get it right, Rose, I promise. Uh, so Dr. Rose is professor of engineering, Ohlone uh, College, right here in California in the Bay Area. Um, we have uh, then Kay, I just want to make sure I have Kay as well. Uh, Kay for Butterfield as well who is uh, with the World Economic Forum and she does, uh, she's the head of the fourth industrial, um, she's the head of AI and machine learning and she's also a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. Amazing folks have joined us today. So let me just hand it over to you all to introduce yourself. Please tell us how you got started in your current role. I can go first. <laughs> Thanks, Mia. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, how did I get started in my role? So I have to rewind a few years back. So I, I grew up in India and uh, I finished my undergrad in computer science. And then I moved to the US for grad school. So I was pursuing my PhD in human factors and ergonomics. And uh, during my graduate school life, uh, I was uh, looking at the impacts of automated systems on the performance of air traffic controllers, you know? So really the concepts that we hear a lot today, which is, you know, trust in automation, system reliability, meaningful human control, you know, all of those ethics terms that we hear today. So I, I think that that was my first introduction to responsible innovation or responsible product development, though those phrases were not in my head at that time. And then I graduated and I worked in healthcare for the longest time. I worked uh, for a company called Medtronic. It's one of the largest med device manufacturers in the cardiac rhythm heart failure business. And uh, there again, I got exposure to another safety critical industry, which is healthcare. And, uh, you know, to get regulatory approval, you got to demonstrate that your products are safe and effective, right, for your end users. And how do you do that? You combine a lot of analytical approaches. Uh, you combine that with empirical approaches like qualitative and quantitative research studies um, so as to make your product safe and, make, and ensure that the residual risk is as small as possible. So fast forward to today, I am on this uh, really uh, unconventional team called Ethics in Society. We, we sit uh, in an engineering organization within the Microsoft's cloud and AI business. And within uh, that uh, team, I lead the discipline of user research. So there's no ethics in society without society, right? So on the team, my role is really to bring uh, the voices of the diverse members of the community, especially those of vulnerable groups, you know, just like you said, Mia, uh, into product development. And, and we work on all sorts of emerging tech like face recognition and synthetic voice, mixed reality, retail AI, and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to say that in the, in the two uh, years and four months or something since we have formed my team, we have actually worked on capturing the voices of 11,000 plus diverse uh, community uh, members who are impacted by the technologies that we are building. So I'll stop here. Uh, thanks again. I can go next because I'm the odd woman out here. I'm the non-engineer. And, um, I, and I'm also slightly different because I represent another piece of diversity in that I'm older than most of the other people on this panel. Um, so I'm not going to go through my entire background because that'll take up the whole panel. So some highlights, I guess. Uh, I actually am a lawyer, so I was a barrister. That's the wig and gown person in the UK. I started working part-time as a judge for them to try me out and me to try them, and I hated being a judge. 
my work was around human trafficking, children and human rights. And in fact, I still belong to one of the foremost um, uh, entities of lawyers doing work on human rights. And um, my human trafficking experience actually sort of led me to thinking about what will this look like when we have AI? Um, and this was prior to Westworld. I should have written that series. Anyway, um, so from there, I, I did my master's degrees in law and international relations, thinking about the geopolitical aspects of AI and also the, and also the legal aspects of AI and what really that sort of led me uh, into a 10 hour plane flight um, with one of the only people on the planet at that time who would have known what I was talking about when I was talking about AI ethics. And he employed me to be the world's first chief, chief AI ethics officer. Um, and uh, that was 2014 when there were very few of us, um, you know, talking about AI ethics. We might have been thinking about it in the way that you were, but we weren't talking about it. So, you know, I was one of the few people who went to Azilomar to think about the Azilomar principles. I became the vice chair of the IEEE's work. Um, there were just 12 of us in December 2015. And thankfully there are now, we're spread out all around the world doing this work. And so I moved to the forum in 2017 because I wanted as I think many of us on this program, uh, on this conference, to stop talking about some of these uh, issues and actually have some impact. And so what we do at the forum is we help companies and countries to devise governance mechanisms around artificial intelligence. And I say governance meet with a small g. We don't do regulation particularly, Although in some cases, like the work we've been doing with Microsoft, we've been thinking about facial recognition, maybe there's some reason to have um, regulation in, in that area. But we, we were, so we worked, for example, with the UK government to create, to co-create with them, their principles around procurement of artificial intelligence for the government. And so we worked with governments around the world and uh, companies around the world, nonprofits, and academic, acad academics, because every project we do has to have that multi-stakeholder component. And um, I'm deeply grateful for being able to work with fabulous people around the world, um, both within the forum and in the communities that we build to carry out the projects. Wow, um, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> but I have to say, according to my daughter, Kay, um, lawyers are also engineers. She says she's a social engineer. My daughter wants to be a lawyer. And I've been saying, she don't be an engineer. She's like, you know what? We're social engineers. We change society for good. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm Rose Margaret Kenny Tua, and I'm a professor at Ohlone College. My journey has been quite interesting, spanning different um, continents. I think that has been a good opportunity for me. But um, my desire for AI and passion for AI or telecommunications really started when I was a kid. And um, we lived in Switzerland for a bit, and of course, um, I think we were one of the first black people in our neighborhood. So innocently, the kids were asking me, hey, do you guys live on trees in Africa, etc." And I was like, oh dear, no, we don't. <laughs> so I shot them photos, etc. But for me, at that point, um, was born the desire to help the world overcome certain biases and prejudices, and some very innocently, because probably that's what they were told. But that wasn't true. And so in high school, I really liked physics and um, I loved electromagnetism. And I was like, wow, I want to learn how to manipulate electromagnetic waveforms and um, help people communicate better. Well, fast track, um, I got my bachelor's degree in electrical electronics engineering, specialized in telecommunications in Nigeria, and then went for grad school in England. So, okay, we've got that in common too. <laughs> 
And um, I studied mobile and satellite communications for my master's. And then my real desire to understand pattern recognition um, and I um, came to um, for during my PhD, I now did my PhD in cybernetics. And I was fortunate to work with a great professor at the University of Reading, Professor Kevin Warwick. And he's the first cyber, the first human on the planet to ever be a cyber, to allow um, a chip implant in him. And it was just so fascinating to see the possibilities of AI then. And then I now became a lecturer at the University of London and fast track, fast track, fast track. My desire for AI continued, but it even came to form more as I started teaching and noticed the discriminatory behavior of AI systems on my students, students of color, students of different underrepresented backgrounds, immigrants. And then I started getting really interested into investigating um, AI ethics. And um, as you all know, telecommunications has evolved a lot and gone into wireless sensor networks. And so now I also coordinate um, the Smart Manufacturing Technology Program at Ohlone College Industry 4.0. We're a national center of excellence and we are the first in California, um, the first community college in California to have that program just to again try to mitigate um, certain AI issues in manufacturing because believe it or not, there's AI issues, AI ethical issues in every single sector. So for me, I focus on AI in education and also for manufacturing. Mia, yeah, just, to, uh, just a quick comment on what Rose said because I think it's important for us as women. You know, strong women create strong daughters. And so just as um, Rose's daughter is a lawyer, my daughter is actually an engineer. She flies in the United States Air Force as a pilot. And so, <laughs> so I think it's really important when we're talking about women and successful women to realize that as mothers, we have a great responsibility in that as well. Absolutely. Oh, that's so true. Awesome. Very well said. You all have such amazing backgrounds and what I love about it is that you all complement each other. So together we can get a much more fuller picture, not just one dimensional views and also your backgrounds make uh, just this such a more interesting conversation to have. So we all talk about diversity, right? And there are so many different elements to dimensions of diversity. Can each of you share maybe in a few, um, like briefly, which, what is your organization's definition of diversity. Yeah, I, I can go. Um, so I think of diversity in a few different ways. One is people build products, right? Um, so it's very, very important that you involve multiple disciplines in your product development process. So it's not just engineers uh, building products, right? So you're bringing in uh, people from more human-centered uh, sort of disciplines like user researchers, anthropologists, designers, linguists, and all of that. And why is that important? Um, it's important because you've got to be able to challenge dominant views. And the only way you can do that is by bringing this kind of diverse thinking and be the voice of the end user or the community into product shaping. Uh, the other thing I feel is important is uh, bringing the perspectives of the community itself and not just do it once and forget about it, right? But doing that throughout the product development life cycle. So right from your envisioning of the product phase to post deployment, getting that continuous feedback from the community, super important. There are three ways we do that. Uh, we do that through... Uh, directly engaging with end users and by end users it's not Microsoft uh, you know uh, uh, employees right that's not representative of end user community by any means so it's really thinking about the diversity uh, the, the spectrum and uh, and especially um, thinking about who could be uh, marginalized um, with this particular technology and that's completely context specific that's very technology specific Right. So um, honestly, uh, we have worked with 
introverts, women, racial minorities, LGBTQ plus community, individuals with visual impairments, mobility impairments, because depending on the technology that you're developing, each of these groups could be considered vulnerable um, in that uh, domain. Um, it's important not to forget about your indirect stakeholders, so not just your end users, but how about the people whose jobs may be impacted by uh, the AI systems that you're building? So very important to think about that as well. Um, honestly, we have also worked with um, people who may have strong views uh, or, or even uh, object to the kind of work that you're working on, right? So we have worked with human rights groups. Uh, we have also created external advisory panels. Um, why that's important is because more and more you see tech companies uh, entering into spaces that they are not uh, traditionally uh, have expertise in. Like for instance, a lot of tech companies are investing in military, for, uh, right? And uh, that's not a domain that you're naturally uh, comfortable in. So how do you leverage the expertise uh, of those who have, you know, um, learned the space uh, and um, so 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 what we have done in that process is really uh, creating external advisory panels with experts from various disciplines like um, military ethicists and um, experts in tech policy law and human system integration and all of that to help us think through some thorny issues um, and then of course uh, uh, lastly I think there is diversity because you need data for training models. And there is diversity when the data sets that are being used for training these AI models actually represent the diversity in society. Again, it's not just trained using, um, you know, just the majority, uh, which is, you know, white males, but it actually represents the diversity um, in, in the society. So I guess we can follow the same order. I'll go next. Um, and so working for something called the World Economic Forum, you know, we, we probably hit the uh, geographical diversity reasonably well because there are 94 different countries represented amongst our staff. But obviously that isn't enough to be just geographically diverse. We have to do more than that. Um, we, and it's essential for us to be able to carry out the work that we do, because as I said, we, we work with countries around the world. So I'm uh, working with 13 different countries at the moment, helping them to create various pieces of AI strategy and governance. Um, and so we need to think about national conversations. So for example, our, um, our partners at the New Zealand government are looking out, are at the moment in, the, in that national conversation around AI, um, which we're helping with. And um, I agree, we, you know, AI is human. A AI should be for the benefit of humans. And unless we get that right, we shouldn't be doing artificial intelligence at all. So we have rules at the forum about diversity. So, you know, Davos is a big thing that we do each year. And so there are rules about the panels, you know, how many women, um, how, how many persons of color. There are rules around making sure that we hear from as many different people as possible. We, my, my colleague Emily Rate and I have just put together the, what we call the Global Futures Council and we specifically said we want one person from Europe, we want one person from America, we want one person from, from Africa, we want one person from all these continents. Once we've done that, then we want to look at um, diversity within those groups as well so that we can produce a really diverse group of people that we bring together to think about the future of artificial intelligence and the, and the way that it can benefit humanity. And likewise, as we are thinking about um, the toy awards that we're going to be awarding in April next year for AI enabled toys, you know, we want to bring into the judges committee people from around the world and although toy awards and AI enabled toys sounds very much like a Western thing, um, 
what that will do and the, the work that we do in, in regard to this will actually help us to think through the issues around using AI for um, education, which obviously has fantastic potential around the world. So I guess I'm next. And um, I wish academia could borrow the World Economics Forum agenda strategy uh, for diversity, well, especially STEM or engineering um, uh, academia, because we're not there yet. Um, if you look at the number of um, female professors in engineering, we're not there yet. The number of um, underrepresented, ethnically um, underrepresented professors in engineering, we're not there yet. So um, in academia, we have a long way to go. And um, I would like to think of academia as the cradle that creates everything that eventually would funnel through to industry and help dive, um, create the diverse sort of products um, that um, all the other panelists have talked about. So I'll backtrack a little bit and just say that for us at Ohlone College and in academia with the group of people I'm working with, um, we do not like to define diversity on its own. We say diversity needs to come with inclusion and also equity, else we would have spent a lot of money trying to get a diverse pool of people and then they leave. And that is the statistics in engineering for women. 40% of women that gain engineering degrees leave engineering. And so that is not what we want. So we initially start off with a diverse pool of people and then after they're all gone. And so there's a quote regarding diversity and inclusion, which I'll just say now, and it's all over the internet. So it's nothing brilliant that I cooked up. It says that um, I think diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think equity is dancing like no one is looking. And I think for me, that is where we're striving towards in academia, because we get students, but we lose them. We get minorities, we get diverse populations, but again, we lose them. And so um, diversity should never be on its own. It needs to come with inclusion and equity, else um, we just wasted our time. That is so true. And uh, thank you for sharing that. We had um, we made a special effort in our event today to invite working mothers who work in this space. And some of the statistics that they shared were very similar and they look pretty bleak because that's exactly it. It's not enough to say we have the doors open for women or minorities but or marginalized groups, but also creating an environment that fosters them, which is invite which is welcoming so they're not like you're bringing people in through the front door and they're just leaving and running out the back door uh, so thank you so much for sharing that um, so rose i have a question specifically just building on what you said it was about you said there are numbers so my question was about metrics like how do we know like are we measuring what matters and that starts with what should we be measuring like what are some of the metrics you mentioned uh representation of women say in academia and such are there others that you'd be looking at and then i'd love to hear from rt as well as k what their thoughts are okay thank you very much um, Mia, for that question and matrix is something that is constantly evolving and we're constantly looking at and recently, I think with some of my colleagues and the different committees and boards that I belong to, we came to the conclusion that for the most part, we have been quantitative data driven. And so we have missed out on a lot of things. We've missed out on where we could have actually had special interventions to stop the, in quote, leading of underrepresented people from STEM. And so what we're trying to collect now is qualitative data how they actually feel so that um, once we get them through the door, we can try to create that sense of belonging and inclusion. And again, going back to AI systems, and I'll talk about this later on, I think it's a lot of data, data, data. Hey, we have XYZ amount of um, products out there, but there's no qualitative data to actually talk about the way people feel about it. For example, Amazon Echo, and I'll talk about it later. I love Amazon Echo, but it's one of the most discriminatory products 
what I know of, it discriminates against my accent because I, and I intentionally maintain my Nigerian British accent. And so my kids will now have to say, hey, mom, move over. I'll use my American accent. He's going to understand it. And even in my classrooms, it's the same thing. I ask my students to do some research, use your phones, use Google or Siri, and then it doesn't understand what they're saying. And so this is really not okay. And so we have lots of data here. We're churning out lots of different products, but we need to collect qualitative data if we really want to create an inclusive AI system, inclusive AI products and systems um, that um, will be sustainable. I agree with Rose. It doesn't recognize my English accent either. Um, and so I have to get my husband to translate for me. Um, and so I just want to add, uh, before I get to the World Economic Forum, I just want to add how difficult it is to change cultures as well. You know, uh, if you look at the United States Air Force, they have been recruiting for a long time or trying to recruit women for a long time to be pilots. The statistics say that if the number of women pilots, and I apologize for the puppy in the background playing, um, the, uh, the statistics say that they still only have 0.06% of women pilots. Now that's cultural. You know, we have to change the, we, it's so difficult because it's not just the KPIs, we also have to change our culture in um, adapting to having more women or persons of color or any other diversity and inclusion and, and being truly inclusive, as Rose said. So going on to the World Economic Forum, you know, we do have KPIs, as I said, for the way that we choose panels at well, our big events like Davos and, and SDI, which is the one that we have for around the SDGs in September, and regional meetings, etc. Uh, we have as a, an AI team, because just as Rose said, you know, you notice the problems with lack of diversity and inclusion so much in AI. Um, we, we've been making a, a special effort to go out and look for people who would not be the normal people in our communities. And one of the problems um, for, the, for the forum is, you know, you, you get the person that, they, that the company sends to you or the government sends to you. So you have to make that special extra effort to reach out to the right academics or the right countries or um, the right nonprofits to make sure that you do have that very diverse group. Uh, can I pause before we go to Arthi? Can we see your puppy? Please. <laughs> I feel one of the benefits or just the upsides of being able to zoom from anywhere. Oh my God, he's adorable. I thought this is a special treat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. He can hang out with us. That's okay. We have a very inclusive group. Four babies, human babies, everybody's welcome here. His oh, what's his name? Her name is Lulu, which is oh. stands for fearless warrior. And when she bites me like this, I can see it. Oh my god. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. She's fierce. <laughs> I can tell like this is a family of just fierce women. Um, and everybody's loving her, so thank you. <laughs> uh, Arthi, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, diversity in AI. Um, I don't think we are there yet in terms of having metrics per se uh, to measure progress. But at the very minimum, what I would say is having at least a set of processes in place so that you're systematically doing um, a few things, like you know, like have you thought about who are the individuals or groups who could be impacted by what you're building? You know, if you're if you're collecting data for training models, I mean the stuff that Rose just talked about, which is uh, as well as K, which is 
oh my God, this uh, system does not recognize my speech. I'm actually working on a speech fairness project. So that's super funny that you both mentioned that. And it's, it's really hard to, uh, to work in that space to improve fairness um, in, in speech. Uh, but anyhow, it's a very important to systematically think through the composition of your training data and assess what's missing. How are you benchmarking between different groups so that it doesn't work well for just one group and leaves out the rest of us who were not potentially, uh, you know, born uh, or raised here and does not speak a certain way, right? Um, does the system uh, unintentionally exclude certain people uh, based on their abilities uh, or something about themselves that they cannot change? What is the impact of the system on vulnerable groups? Do you have the right feedback mechanisms in place to continuously get this feedback from your impacted community versus, you know, waiting till shit just goes, uh, you know, uh, going down and then just hearing uh, uh, about stuff when that happens. So these are all things that you have to think through very systematically uh, throughout your product life cycle. So, uh, yeah, so that's what I think. Uh, at some point, yes, you should have some sort of metrics in place, but um, we're not there yet. That is absolutely fair. I, it's so nice. And even that, I feel like even the fact that we're having this conversation is a great start. And I always look at it, it's a journey. We're not going to get there overnight, but it's wonderful just be able to have this open conversation. Um, so we, I would love to now dive deep into each one of your roles because, again, every one of you brings a very unique perspective, right? Um, RT, you represent a big, large corporation. Um, Rose is with um, higher education and then Kay with World Economic Forum. So starting with you, Arthi, can we talk about more, um, some details on a project where you have included this diverse perspective? You alluded to some, and then uh, there was a, actually a question in there about your training data set. If you'd like to share more about that as well, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um... So we try to do that on almost all projects that we work on. Um, the way we work is we partner very closely with product teams, uh, you know, embed very closely with them and try to make sure that we think about all the different community members who could be impacted and really try to bring their voices in. I'm going to speak about uh, one particular project per se, because it's really nice to see the spectrum of the individuals that we got to interact with. It's, uh, it's a project on custom neural voice. Um, so the whole idea behind the technology is, um, you know, you take 500 to 1000 utterances of one person um, and you're able to create a voice font that uh, represents you. So it's, 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 a, it's a likeness of you, right? But the problem with that is it could go ahead and say a lot of things that you never said. So, so the misuse of the system can result in lots of issues, right? It's like a fundamental threat uh, to public trust and, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, your human rights, right? So uh, what, I mean, we did a lot of things, but for uh, simplicity's sake, I'm just going to touch on a few things uh, on this project. Um, we started off serving the general public to understand their perceptions towards a technology like this in different domains, right? In different scenarios. What do they think about uh, this technology? And remember, this is like pretty good technology. Like it, it, it sounds really uh, good. Um, you could be easily fooled. Um, so based on the um, surveys and the interviews that we did with consumers, who, you know, people who could be general consumers of this product, what we learned was that the number one thing that's important is disclosure. So it's very important to uh, minimize any sort of deception. So disclose uh, to the uh, consumer that you're actually interacting with a synthetic agent. I mean, this happened with Google Duplex, if you remember, several years ago when, um, uh, when Sundar was trying to demo uh, the program and got a huge backlash because uh, it was like, oh my God, this is so realistic, but is this really a synthetic agent? So uh, disclosing um, that is very important. Um, the other important thing is if the system is high fidelity, so in other words, it really, really uh, sounds like you, then your expectations from the system is also high. So in other words, if you're using uh, that voice, let's say for a transaction, right, a financial transaction or uh, making a travel uh, a reservation or something, 
it's it's super important that it's high fidelity even in those in in that scenario uh, what i'm trying to say is if the capabilities and limitations of the system do not match the high fidelity then the trust that the end user can have on the system can go really bad um and uh, really being cautious about um where you deploy these systems you don't want to use synthetic voice uh, especially one that's like really high fidelity in a, in an emergency scenario you know where you're calling 911 and you're interacting with a human sounding synthetic voice so these are some of the things that we learned from our consumers and that then ended up being in our disclosure guidelines or uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry deployment guidelines um that we provide uh, as a platform builder um, that we provide to our customers, to Microsoft's customers. Um, we also uh, interviewed voice actors. Uh, now, they are not the users of this technology per se, but they are a group of individuals who are indirectly impacted by technology because this technology could potentially take away their job, right? Um, so what we heard um, from them was concerns over really they wanted control over how their voice font should be used and they should they wanted to be compensated each time it was being used because it, it is like derived from their voice font and this resulted in um, again transparency guidelines that we created uh, towards uh, voice actors and having clear contractual specifications on how the voice uh, could be used, the duration of use, a fair compensation, all of that stuff. Uh, we also worked with individuals with speech impairments to understand what are their specific needs when interacting with something like synthetic uh, voice, because this is presumably a technology that would really, really bolster their autonomy. So we learned a lot of things uh, from them that we take for granted. And that's why it's like super important to bring in that diverse perspectives, right? Otherwise we are designing things for us, you know, for, uh, for us. And we are not thinking about the whole uh, diversity of uh, your users. So what we learned from these group of individuals is flexibility in wanting to change things about their pitch and their accent and other voice characteristics because they struggle a lot with these things, right? And what about if it's a kid uh, who has a speech impediment? Uh, as the kid reaches puberty, they want uh, an ability to make modifications uh, to their voice form so that they sound like an adult versus as a kid. So this again uh, resulted in a set of design considerations individuals with speech impairments. And all of these um, then resulted in a set of guidelines that we created uh, for our uh, customers. Uh, I hope I answered your first part of your question. Um, I think you raised a, a question on fairness. Yeah, so uh, speech fairness um, is something that I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, top of the mind for me right now. Uh, back in March, a study uh, was published by Stanford. I mean, it's not surprising the results, but uh, we, uh, uh, a study was um, published wherein they showed that um, the performance of automatic, automatic speech recognition systems are poorer for certain demographics, uh, such as uh, specifically in this case, um, Black and African American uh, population in comparison to um, Caucasians. And uh, so we're trying to solve that problem. I mean, uh, really the root cause here is the lack of representation in the data, right? So the step uh, zero is really collecting more data, but it's not as simple as saying just collect more data. When you think about data collection, you have to think about what regions in the United States should you be sampling from? Uh, what are the criteria is important, like the gender uh, identity, you know, it may be different for females versus males. What about other things like, um, uh, age groups, uh, where you learn the language, uh, at what age did you acquire it, um, whether you have probably have, uh, you know, speech impediments or not, your speech delivery characteristics. You see what I'm saying? So there are lots of factors that uh, come into play and uh, coming up with a priority list of what things are most important to, uh, to, uh, to prioritize and uh, in step zero or phase zero of a data collection and then making progress, right? Because it's, it's, it's a journey, like you said earlier, it's a journey. Um, so it's, it's hard. It's very important, but it's really hard. So my point being, um, operationalizing ethics and diversity and all of these concepts is requires a lot of intentional investment and a lot of thinking. 
I think the key word here, exactly what you said, is being intentional. It's 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 not as easy. Okay, we'll put a tweet out there, or we'll have an Instagram post, and this is your yeah, here's a PR statement, right, on diversity to actually operationalize, put it into action, considerations that you mentioned. That was super insightful, thank you so much. Um, because those are the details that a lot of folks are not privy to, very simply because the scale at which a company has to operationalize is not always visible. So thank you for sharing that. I do want to add one more thing, because that's relevant, which is one particular discipline cannot come in and solve this problem. So this is what I was saying earlier. Um, to solve this, it requires a village. Um, because just as right now on this particular project, uh, we are partnering with, of course, the engineers who are responsible for the speech platform, but we have user researchers working on it. We have uh, Microsoft uh, research MSR uh, experts uh, who are experts in fairness uh, uh, partnering with us. We have uh, social linguists who are helping us. So it actually takes a village to systematically think through all of these issues. So diversity in your organization and having that safe space to actually think through these things in a systematic manner, that is really, really important for success. Agreed. Amen. Uh, th th thank you so much for that super detailed, insightful look at how things actually get operationalized. Uh, so why don't we move to, um, to a different perspective? Napke mentioned at World Economic Forum, she's been working with governments to responsibly adopt. Now that is another whole level, right, of complexity. So Kay, can you share your perspective from a working with large organizations is one thing, but you're working at governmental scale. So do you want to, you're, you're on mute. Uh, so we do, we do um, also work with, with companies and um, we've actually got a fabulous piece of work that we're doing around um, tech ethics. They're not just AI ethics, but responsible use of, of technology generally. And, you know, very happy to have Microsoft as a partner for that. Um, and so, uh, where to start? Yes, it's, it's hard working with, with countries, but um, the countries come to us because they all want to do the right thing, and many of them don't know where to start. Um, and so, I, I tend to ask them to start with an AI strategy. So that they can, you know, just as a company would start with a strategy of what they want to do, so should a country, because then they can think about what it is that's important to them in the AI space, what they want to achieve with AI, and then how to put in the financial, the foundational underpinnings of it, which I, in which I would include the diversity, the inclusion, the equality, the human centered the bias, the fairness, the, um, all the other pieces of the, of the jigsaw that is AI ethics. Um, and so, you know, it's no use a country sort of saying, well, we want to use AI in agriculture and we want to make agriculture better without really sort of thinking through all those very foundational pieces of what do we need to put in place in order to make this AI for agriculture piece work and work for the citizen and the human being um, and, and not be AI for AI's sake because it's an interesting buzzword at the moment. So just to give you an example of the sort of things that we're doing, um, facial recognition, a lot of people didn't want to take on facial recognition and I work very closely with Brad Smith who's um, president of Microsoft and um, we're privileged to have him as co-chair of our Global AI Council and you know we both spoke in Davos about two years ago saying we need to do something about facial recognition and um, and its deployment and so we did we with the French government we've been looking at what would be the right uh, rules, again with a small r, for deployment of AI in facial recognition um, commercially. And we're just extending that project with Unicree, Interpol and uh, various police forces around the world to tackle that thorny issue that we are seeing. You know, what, is, what are our rights as human beings? 
compared to the right of governments and companies to use facial recognition. And that bleeds into the work that we do. You know, talking about diversity, we, we believe very strongly that, that children are absolutely vital to our future because they are our future. And so we need them included in the conversations. So when I was talking about the toy awards, you know, facial recognition is used by some of these toys. So what are the issues that we should be examining there? What's the advice we should be giving to parents? Um, what's the advice that governments should be having and the actions that governments should be having? So we've worked closely with UNICEF on the paper that they now have out for public consultation around the use of AI by children and for children. Um, then I, I told you about the work that we do, we're doing with New Zealand around reimagining regulation. And if it's not, not regulation in the traditional legal sense, what is it with regard to AI? And um, having that public discourse um, and then with the UK government, for example, as I say, really working to not only provide guidelines, but to provide a handbook. That was what, you know, everybody, we're all looking at operationalizing ethics. You can't just um, say, well, you know, here are some te 10 high level guidelines, get on with it. You've actually got to give these poor procurement officers the tools that they can use to actually translate those 10 principles into action. So that's the sort of work that we've been doing and, and really important, you know, we included a lot of the diversity pieces in all the work that we've been doing with governments and particularly, for example, in New Zealand, where, you know, they have this wonderful inclusion of the, of the Aboriginal culture, the Maoris, in all that they do. That's wonderful. We actually had a session earlier today when um, on indigenous protocols and inclusion in AI. So that definitely resonates. It, thank you so much, Ake, for sharing that insight. Again, we're getting insights that we wouldn't normally get because we are not privy to those details and the level that you work at, at the government level. Uh, so insights are really super helpful. So uh, moving on to uh, Rose. Rose, uh, you offer a very different perspective. You are higher education, um, and you recently were nominated to the board of directors for the Society of Women Engineers. You're really a force to be reckoned with. So can you share, Rose, like what is your perspective? How are you going to change the world? Like you have the power. <laughs> How are you going to make sure <laughs> that people, are, uh, organizations are being more inclusive and it's more um, of a welcoming environment for women engineers? Thanks for that. Yeah, it was an honor to serve on the board of directors for the Society for Women Engineers. And um, we are definitely um, trying to get the job done. And our approach or my personal approach is just one person at a time, one organization at a time. And that is how we can truly make an impact. And so um, using the platform that SWE has provided for me, um, I have been able to connect also with the IEEE. I'm a member of the IEEE and um, I'm actually the chair of the IEEE Special Interest Group for Humanitarian Technology, Oakland is based section. And um, fortunate to work with people that are on the standards for the Internet of Things Committee. And so we're working on democratizing the internet because I think we can talk about AI systems all day, but if we do not have the internet Wi-Fi access available to everyone, everything AI is lost. And so AI um, works on the internet of things. So we're strongly working on the democratization of the internet so that it's available, affordable for everyone, especially marginalized societies. And so again, with that role, we are paying special attention, um, giving scholarships through SWE to lots of underrepresented students, especially post COVID-19 and during COVID-19, because again, um, with everything going remote, all educational platforms now being online, um, marginalized societies now face even a double, should I call it double whammy? <laughs> because of, I mean, they already have this, the problem of the digital divide, and then now, again, everything has moved online, and they need to work with all these interesting AI systems. So we're also working on trying to ensure Sure that every child, every, every student has a laptop to work with, has internet access. 
and especially we're focusing on focusing on girls and um, women i'll say women because in my class i have women some are older than me and so just making sure that they have access um, because some of them are mothers and they're um, they have kids and we need to make sure that they have access to the right digital equipment to help them succeed and then also on a, on a personal level just looking at education generally um, i'm also focusing on discriminatory behavior by AI systems in education, especially when it comes to proctoring exams. And so I'm not going to mention the platforms <laughs> here, but there are several platforms out there that are being used to proctor exams, tests, and quizzes that have been known to really discriminate between people of color or women. And basically these systems are using how often you blink your eye. So an average black person probably blinks their eye more, how slow your hand moves. And I'm, I'm like, geez, this is not okay. And so you find out after an exam, a, a professor would say, oh, you cheated, you were slow. You, your hand motion, your eye was blinking too fast because we're relying on this, um, should I say erroneous AI systems. And so that is one of the things that we're really taking on board trying to give feedback to some of these platforms that uh, they're exhibiting discriminatory behavior. And as a result, we're seeing that underrepresented students are not doing well in this online learning environment. Um, and really no fault of theirs is because of the proctoring systems that are not, um, um, that are not um, inclusive. Another issue that we're working on in education is just humanizing AI systems. Our students face a lot of mental health issues in California. We've had um, COVID, we've had, well, nationally we had George Floyd, and then we had wildfires. It's like, okay, right, what else? Um, and so we see that lots of our students are going through mental health issues. And then they log into an online system, an AI online system, and is still busy talking like a robot. No human feelings, no how was your day. I think Alexa is a little bit better now, but other systems, there's no human element to it. And so it is extremely important, and I'm glad that the operations people and product designers <laughs> like Arathi are here to take on board the humanizing element of of AI, it's so important. And um, I have to say um, some AI systems are actually causing more mental health issues for people than, than normal. But I want to also give a shout out to Microsoft. I like Microsoft Teams. <laughs> I think Microsoft Teams has taken on board research I did for my PhD and I was like, wow, did they look into my thesis? And um, just really understanding generational cognitive orientation mindsets. And I think uh, Microsoft has really pinned that in understanding the flow, the AI flow, the flow and navigation um, that suits the current generation that we're dealing with. And that's why I think um, in academia, Microsoft Teams might be the next big thing and is really getting embraced. And um, do I have any other thing? I think I will stop there. There's a lot, but I think for us, the important thing is to ensure that every girl, every woman, every person has in access to the internet and they have a digital equipment to work with and they feel included uh, with whatever AI platforms that they're using. Well, Rose, I've said this before and I'll say this again. If you ever run for office, I don't do <laughs> for public office. I'm fully coming and working on your campaign because that was what you shared was just brilliant. And I love that you pointed out inclusion means even access to technology. We live in a bubble in the Bay Area via Zoom. There's Wi-Fi everywhere, and that's such a fallacy. So um, we only have ten minutes, uh, eight minutes actually, just for keeping an eye on time. So I have a question. Um, maybe you can touch on it lightly, or maybe we can go to Kay and come back to you and then Arti. Um, the recent protest against flawed algorithms, right? That's literally at the intersection of this education, this biased and discriminatory algorithms, what the students in um, are going through when AI um, is, is assessing their scores based on prior, their past um, scores. So can you uh, share a little bit more about your thoughts? I'll let you and Kay decide who wants to go first, but it's about the A-levels and the students who are protesting in UK recently. Well, I'll go first, really, with the with the sort of bigger picture, and then Rose can talk about the, the the student experience. I think 
I think it's really important that um, we see this as even more of a wake up call to all of us, whether we're government, sorry, that's the cat. Um, <laughs> this is becoming a zoo, um, domestic zoo, uh, zoom instead, sorry. Um, and so, you know, whether it's governments or and the way that they think about, um, as they did in the UK, using uh, Ofqual to um, create algorithms or buy-in algorithms that were obviously flawed. Um, so it's a wake-up call, I think, to governments. I think it's a wake-up call to companies who are providing this. I hope it's a wake-up call to the companies that will be using AI but are not the Microsofts of this world. So the non-technology companies who will be using AI and don't have the foundational ethics programs that, that um, the tech companies have been able to um, create. You know, there's a Gartner survey out there that by 20, a uh, Gartner report out there that by 2022, unless we get a handle on bias, 85% of the algorithms that we create will be erroneous. Um, so it's, it's part of this big picture of what I would call tech clash that we were talking about in 2019. And um, it's important because, you know, there was this sort of everything, AI will be able to solve everything in COVID and it'll be amazing. And we lost for a while the conversation around the problems of AI that we need to solve before we can use it for the benefit of humanity. And so I think that this is an important wake up call. So that's the big picture. I'll leave Rose to talk about the impact of the poor students involved. Thank, Thank you very much, Kay, for giving us that great big picture. And um, I think on the students' perspective, the, the ramifications are far reaching. It's a ripple effect. And I have to say, sometimes we see one person, one student, but that student is connected to so many other people, their parents, their grandparents, their sisters, their sibling. And so this is a ripple effect. Once a student, like the case in the UK, where basically they were using algorithms that use data, um, that they used historical data on performance of schools. And so they basically marked down students that were in schools, catchment areas that historically hadn't performed well. And so that affected even students that would have normally perfected well and so um, performed better. And so this was clear discrimination. But at the same time, I'm like, maybe it was <laughs> just outright laziness. That's what I thought, because nobody just wanted to do the work. And in engineering, we have this phrase, garbage in, garbage out. And so for me, I'm like, it's no surprise you're trading in all data. You're going to get all the manifestations, all the same things, racial injustice, biases, et cetera, that we've always had because we're using old data. And so I think in the AI community, engineering, science, government, everyone, we need to be ready to do the work. If we really, I think that AI has a lot of opportunities to help break the um, biases and prejudices and discriminatory behavior, but we've got to invest and do the work to really start gathering new data. We're still using old data, and that's why we're getting the manifestations that we're getting, but they're really adversely affecting students. Um, so I call out to everyone, let's do the work, get new data, and then we are actually going to see the impact and the effect we really want to see in um, breaking gender and um, ethnic biases. And just echoing Rose, you know, let's do the work. Let's not imagine that AI is going to be able to do everything for us. And let's, as a first principle, say, do we need AI here? Or is there a better way of approaching this? Indeed, indeed. Um, thank you. We lost uh, down to the last three minutes. I would love to get Arthi to start us off with just in the last few minutes. Arthi, can you share some specific tools and techniques and actions that you would recommend that audience uses for ethical development? Any of your favorite tools? What's working well for you? Sure, sure, sure. I think the first thing uh, is what Kay just said, which is, is this really a technology problem? You know, uh, what am I trying to solve here? Is it really a technology problem? Uh, then it's really articulating um, the impact of the technology. You know, uh, the, the example that you just gave, 
um, if the developers had done some homework in terms of determining what are the benefits versus the risks uh, of this technology to disadvantaged communities or disadvantaged uh, students uh, from certain backgrounds, this would have been this would not have happened, right? So I believe um, we have another session um, uh, from the Microsoft uh, uh, folks today and uh, Harmony is gonna walk through harms modeling. That's something that we do that works really well for us, which is we systematically sit with product teams and think through who are the stakeholders of the technology? What could be the benefits? What could be the harms? What are the different types of harms? And what are the ways we can mitigate these? through research and design by bringing the perspectives of the community. So, um, so, so, that, so that's what I would uh, re recommend, which is, is this a tech problem? Do some sort of impact assessment, uh, analyze, you know, uh, use your analytical approaches and think through the harms and what can go wrong. Use empirical approaches as well, which is bring in uh, the community because there is nothing like hearing directly from the community there's no substitute for that. And then, of course, all the fantastic principles uh, that we have around Microsoft has its own ethical principles, uh, six ethical principles, fair, um, fairness and inclusiveness and transparency, privacy, security, thinking through all of these uh, and making sure that all of this is thought through while you're developing um, products. And of course, People, I, I say this, uh, I don't, uh, this, this, this is so important, which is people develop technologies. So giving them a safe space to, uh, to ask these questions, which requires a lot of leadership support um, and creating that safe environment for people and even incentivizing them for a responsible product development. Yeah, that's what I would say. Very well said. It needs a human in the loop always. Uh, so, Rose and Kate, any closing thoughts on any tools that you've seen that are working really well? I've heard of what, like, what uh, Arthi just shared. Are there anything else you'd like to add before we end this? Well, I think, I think it's just a question of continuing to go back to the question of looking at your teams and see uh, for diversity, thinking about the product for inclusive, inclusivity and equality. Um, and, you know, we are a very small team, but we have a diversity champion now as a result of some of the problems that we were seeing. And just every week, um, our diversity champion brings us a diversity moment, which makes sure that we're reflecting all the time on, the, on these really important issues. Um, and I think also, you know, I. I would obviously say that even if you're a startup, you shouldn't be ignoring this. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, startups should have some sort of a, a buy on um, ethics because they're a startup and they won't get money and, and they won't be able to innovate. But actually, do we want companies out there that don't have any ethical compass when it, when it comes to AI? I don't think we do. And I think the third thing is, you know, let's try and encourage women and people of color founders. Um, so that again is one of those systemic problems. We don't have enough money flowing into to that community for all the who are trying to make their mark in this area. I would definitely echo what. Um, Kay said, and also what Arathi said, wealth creation is extremely important. And um, UNESCO um, created a white paper, um, published a white paper, I think last year, on the opportunities and um, challenges of AI in education. Well, I'm an educator, so I focused on education. But they have this competition, the Global Learning X Prize, each year just asking AI developers to come together and create inclusive equitable platforms for education. So anyone that likes the education space, and I think that's the hot cake now, <laughs> um, should definitely look into that from UNESCO and um, the Global Learning Prize. Um, but I, in conclusion, I just want to say that as an engineer, as just as humans, we create technology to advance humanity. And so let's constantly weigh this anytime we sit down together to design AI systems and ask the question, are we truly advancing humanity or are we taking humanity back?